human movement is transitioning. We will go beyond sports, performance, or art. We will even go beyond health. Because the unified movement perspective is bigger than the sum of its parts. Every time you spend time with Ido Kotal, you learn something. You're not winning any trophies here. No belts, you're not winning any money. We're learning. So we should be able to move in any position. The problem is once we abandon, it's very hard to go back. When we start to have injuries, the next thing you do, you write a book about it. All these possibilities. If you're the DJ, you control the party. Once you make the tempo, now you can break the tempo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who makes the tempo breaks the tempo. You're gonna see a very different Michael Page, um, and it's only gonna make me that much more dangerous. The podcast is called The Real Work. I don't know whether I'm doing the real work, and I don't think I ever will. I just think that's, that's where I orientate myself towards and then I go off course and then I reorientate myself towards it. I still emotionally over the years I've had I've been lucky enough to find accidentally some of the best instructors in the world in different things in my opinion and then the evidence was from the results and then I googled one day some CrossFit and there was uh, a few people talking about stuff. And I was like, it's nonsense, nonsense. And then I just saw the visuals of your ability for self-dominance, I believe one of the videos was at the time. And there was something about it that the quality of what you were doing was a particular level. And then the essence of what you were saying matched it. They were on par, which meant for me, there was some type of emotional stability mm. between the two. I didn't know what that was at the time. So I, I Googled, where will you be? And I found London. And then I came to London. And as soon as I walked in the room, I became nervous, but not the nervous that puts you into a position where you can't be yourself, the nervousness that was gonna make me be myself and grow out of it. So it was like a seed cracking open. So this interview, without my enormous monologues, will be questions about the development of students and the relationship between the students and the teacher. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit on that, that emotional feeling, that, that thing where the student comes in and they're completely frozen. It's not from fear, I don't think. It's from maybe awe, maybe respect, maybe fear as well, mixed in together. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, it's very related to not seeing clearly, being climbing the mountain in the bottom of a, a certain, you know, metaphorical mountain, and knowing that the person in position of a teacher at that moment is observing down and he can see you and he can see some path. It doesn't mean he sees the full path and it doesn't mean it's a, the right path even, but it is a, the, 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 the differential between the positions creates that sensation. I'm exposed. I'm, I'm being seen. There is really good sides to it. Somebody sees me, but he can also through this penetration has the potential also to harm um, and i think it's a mixture of all these things when you when you're in the presence at least it was for me in the presence of my teachers and people who i can call my teachers um, so maybe that and then the people that you call your teachers did they stay as your teacher or is everybody your teacher or is everything your teacher? How has that developed in, in you? Yeah, all of the above, really. Um, everybody's a teacher and we're, we keep switching. We all place the hat of a teacher even multiple times a day. 
And even we're teaching, our, teaching ourselves and we become a teacher to ourselves through internal dialogues and various processes. And then there is another layer uh, which I hold very dear uh, to people I call my teachers who contributed to an accumulation of a critical mass that transformed something in me. And that I would say qualify you as my teacher. And there are, I don't need to take my shoes off to count the number of teachers, even though I've studied with dozens and dozens and dozens. Um, because the fact that you picked up something from someone doesn't mean he was teaching you and doesn't mean he was actually responsible or contributing to something that truly transformed you irrevocably uh, to a different entity, metamorphosis. And uh, when, I, when I mention the word teacher, that's what I mean. So oftentimes people say, I've, I'm a student of Edo or... And, Actually, it's not the truth through this point of view, um, because they, they might have received pieces of information, etc., but not necessarily dive deep enough into the practice and the work and receive guidance in an organized fashion that reached this critical mass, phase shift. So we talk about this in my classes a little bit, what you just explained it in a much clearer way, the critical mass, the, the point of no return. Remembering that you can always return if you don't keep the practice going. But, and that's why I try, to say, I try to develop people so they can't, they get to a point where they realize that they have to do the work and that is the thing that stops them going backwards. But I've seen, we call it the map masters, Jardy Tension mentions the big fat black belts that say they've been training for 30 years but the last 15 years they've been sat at the side of the mat screaming orders eating chips this is something that with different people it takes a different amount of time to develop so it's, is it a very individual thing very individual very dependent on the scenario on internal resistance we play tricks on ourselves, we, con we confuse ourselves, we hide from ourselves various pieces. And hence, it's sometimes very difficult to reach that critical mass. And, but once that critical mass has been achieved, it's almost, it, there is a paradoxical thing about it, that you can work for 20 years and go nowhere, to go everywhere in a moment. So that is that phase shift, that transformation or you can also call it crystallization like if you're accumulating enough of a certain substance or a liquid it reaches a critical mass and then that substance crystallizes and becomes more stable and resistant so to go back is difficult or sometimes even impossible and the, the, this critical mass we, if we call it integrity or the human spirit or what your whatever terminology we can put onto it, one of the aspects of trauma and emotional abuse is other people separating it. So a narcissist is an example. They will gaslight people and they'll distort people's reality by creating illusions around them. This can be a massive learning curve to be in that situation and then realize what's happening to yourself and, and come out the other side but it's about putting p pieces back together but isn't that what we do in life we start off just as we are and then we get these concepts of illusions and we fit them together and they come apart this week you've sp spoken about the labyrinths so the, the puzzles the mazes and one of the things that i notice is Every time you come out of the labyrinth, there is a, a tougher puzzle to solve, and hopefully that goes forever. One part of it is the labyrinth that I feel like I'm in, is that when I move, the labyrinth moves around me. So then I have to move, make another move. So it's, it's solving a puzzle of moving parts, which is exponentially harder than solving a static puzzle. Mm. Can you elaborate on this at all? Yeah, first, the concept of the labyrinth is a 4,000-year-old concept that uh, distinguishes a certain attribute of the practice or the work 
or the self-transformation. It is not a straightforward type of work. It is a riddle. You said very honestly, I'm involved with a work and with a practice, and I'm not sure it's the real thing, and I'm not sure I'll ever get to the real thing. These are the words of somebody who is on his way or is already in practice, in the real practice. Or as my teacher calls it, the nearest path. It cannot be the path. If you point at what you do as the real thing, you're already not in the Tao, the Tao that cannot be spoken of. Or, you know, you hear this message in a lot of different places, in Sufism, etc. So the labyrinth is there to say, I'm working my way through this riddle. This is a riddle. I, it's not a straightforward practice or work. And then there are layers to it. As you're resolving one part, other deeper parts are coming. It, it escalates. It becomes more and more difficult, one labyrinth to another, but easier in the sense that you get to, the, to get used to and you improve in your capacity to solve labyrinths in general. And uh, I think this is very much related to how I view things and how I try to pass on things and how I myself practice. Stepping into the labyrinth or stepping into the question, being in awe, being busy with not knowing more than in knowing, and by doing that, gaining insights, endless insights that keeps coming instead of gaining a static, what you call the static labyrinth, which is not a labyrinth um, in that sense of the word. Because if you look at the labyrinth, it was always a ridiculous thing. If I looked at them as a child, it's easy to solve. So what's the big labyrinth? You just it's a unipath labyrinth, but it's moving. It's transforming. It's full of hollow. It's a hall of mirrors. It's full of illusions. It's the garden of forking paths. And that is the real sense of the labyrinth of our, our life, our time here why we are here, the work that we came to do here, not to waste it, and the small labyrinths of every day, of a phase of one life, of a physical labyrinth that you have to resolve in fighting, for example, or in dancing, or in working as a performer, or starting a business. And these are all steps along the way and informs the big one as well. So one of the solutions for solving a basic labyrinth is place your left hand on the wall and walk so your hand doesn't come off the wall this will find you to the middle carry on it finds you the exit another way to solve a labyrinth is uh, walk in turn left until you've create created a 360 degree turn and then retrace your steps and go the other way retracing your steps in a labyrinth so for me this means to know where you came if you don't know where you came from it's going to be very difficult to navigate and without navigation, we end up lost. Um, in the story, a Borges story about the desert. So we end up in the desert and that's a very difficult labyrinth because we have nothing to direct ourselves and orientate ourselves off of, apart from probably the rain, if it storms or some sandstorms, all sorts of things. So retracing the steps for, for me I went through a huge program on complex trauma if you look at the characteristics of complex trauma 60 characteristics you can see them everywhere because we get what we look for if you associate yourself with some of the characteristics for ADHD you can find them in everybody if you look at the autism spectrum you can find it in everybody because it's everything everywhere all of the time but retracing your steps isn't just looking back at the past and, and knowing what happened to you. It's processing it and understanding. So in terms of, for, from yourself, can, can we quickly look back and maybe understand and process uh, just an event that happened to you, something that you don't mind sharing? Mm. Yeah, if you're going into, well, it's not, a, it's not the goal. My, my issue is sometimes people go into the past and solving the issues of the past as the goal. Instead, it's almost like a side effect of a proper practice and honesty and presence that naturally you realize things about the past, etc. 
And me as you, we were raised in martial arts and martial art has its own style of abuse, yeah. uh, which is not often mentioned. I'm not talking about even a physical abuse or a sexual abuse, but uh, martial art and especially traditional martial art, but not only, um, carries with it a style of doing things um, that involved um, a lot of distortions, a lot of ego. The teachers of traditional martial arts were often not really involved with fighting per se, but with some aspect of fighting. They were already removed from the challenge and they were removed from the mechanism that also keeps an ego in check. Um, something that a sports coach in another field, in a competitive field, will immediately know and be aware of. Um, so what happens there is that you, I, that's how I grew into this field and I've, I've been in this way abused, although I did not realize it took me a long time, by various teachers and ways. And then I became also the abuser myself, passing on the only thing that I knew. I thought that was martial art. The title should be abuse, but we are unaware. And then through the years and moving in between different fields and observing and seeing the relationship with people and seeing what is actually contributing and what not, um, I started to get more and more glimpses of it. One of the things that I realized is I was always very good and very fine-tuned about the process, not the person. I didn't care so much about the person. If the person broke, the person broke. But it was all about pinpointing the weak links in the process and making, fixing them. What I gained, incredible students that became incredible teachers. Nowadays, they're all over the world teaching and known in their community as the best. But they all have a lot of issues, issues with me, issues with the process, etc. And it's a very contradictory thing. It got them to where they are, the skill, but also cost in certain aspects. And I think this is part of the, these realizations. I've been doing it since a young age. I've been teaching for 30 years now. Um, and uh, little by little realizing how do we go to the long one, to the long haul. To really transform, we need decades, we need a lifetime of practice. We got to take care also of the individual. It doesn't mean we're not going to push, we're not going to be critical, offer difficult ideas, challenge people, but it means that we cannot afford to ignore the person with its current personality and characteristics and weaknesses and strengths and addictions be, or else we're not going to get enough time to really transform. So maybe the student would be there for a year or five, but wouldn't be there for 15 years sometimes. And that, that's some realizations. Yeah. yeah. So I've been saving this one for two days. Earlier this week, you said that a teacher of yours has invited two students to train, but invites one two days earlier. And then the other student turns up and is, is jealous of the student, not realizing that they've been given two days. I've been lucky enough to be, to be given training from, from you on a couple of occasions, which is not, not expected. And I'll forever be grateful for those opportunities. For me this week, something happened where you mentioned this story. And then in one of the classes, I wasn't bending my knees. And I always shout at my students, bend your knees, bend your knees. I understand the process. So when you tell me to bend my knees, I, I say, and you've, you've done it again. You have, you have to listen, you have to stay focused. And then I was, I was gonna try and ask you a question. I don't know if you'd noticed this or if it was done on purpose or not. And I said, I, 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 Edo, but my voice didn't come out because something was triggered in me. I, I, I was still there, but something had left. And I, I was, oh man, and I looked around and you, you played with someone in the class. So you like, uh, you give them a little shoulder barge, grab hold of them. And then I looked and I was like, this is, this is the lesson. This is, this is the thing where you, you lose merit, credit, 
if it, credit in a bank account, every time my knees aren't bent, I'm spending money. I'm not, I'm spending the lessons by tipping them away. So if I go through the pain, I have an opportunity now where you have told me do something. If I do it, I know you'll notice. And I know that when you notice, you will give me the credit back. And that's what happened. I don't know if you can talk about this, could, but you don't have to tell me whether it was intentional or it wasn't intentional. <laughs> uh, I, know, I think I know the answer, but it's more about the process of, of this ref, refining a student, your sandpaper in a way. And then once you get to a certain level, you have to change the grade of the sandpaper, like polishing metal. We, we have to use uh, different cloths. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you can talk about this, this process. The most difficult thing to do is to, to practice, to practice honestly, because you're never in a comfort, you're never in a resting position. So it can be a bending of the knee and keeping it or a maintaining of attention or, or being emotionally responsible and, and stable. And these, this burden is, it gives incredible gifts back. There is a deep sense of calmness and a deep sense of happiness, not the emotional happiness that most people refer to, by knowing you're putting an effort. Together with it, it's always made clear um, that you're not uh, practicing as, as completely and as honestly as one could in no situation. Are you satisfied? This is installed into the practice. You are, you're uphill, and that's, that's the sensation in your legs, right? So when you represent that, when you bring that to the table as a teacher, a student who is not fully observant of it will also have, will gravitate away because the aches, the pains, the constant challenge would have to protect himself, he would have to take breaks or sometimes totally disappear, creating some kind of a fabrication why that process is not good or why that person is not a good teacher, etc. And I think this is also a, another responsibility taken by the teacher that really pushes, that really creates. It's not just about loving and you know, like being a loving mother or a, or a figure or a figure of parent. Here you are pushing people and it's always into pain, into suffering. This pain and suffering should be conscious, but it still contains this action, this quality of suffering that is the actual friction that creates the heat that is required for transformation. Transformation needs energy. Where is that energy? It comes from that friction. So when I tell bend the knees, and again it's going, if you didn't feel bad about it, if it, it wouldn't work. Bending the knees did not matter. And then once your knees get used to it, another aspect would be required to create the same energies. And the game continues. Yeah, yeah so this week I've rewritten an information pack for new students that are coming into the gym. I've had to do it two ways where they have written information that's been given to them, but also an explained video talking through it, almost a small lecture for, for new customers to say, this is what we do. At the beginning, these people are customers. After a certain amount of time, we have a relationship. Then after a while, they become friends and then some of them become family and the people that you have around you. And, you and you talk about one spark. So, so the shame that people feel is one of these balls of energy that can be lit and it, every chemical reaction causes another action. So if you light someone's shame, they may run away. If you over promote somebody, they might get delusions of grandeur. If you under promote somebody, you might cause them depression. So all of these different sparks are going off all the time. And again, it's another labyrinth. The instructor has to do this. What, one of the things that I was thinking was on a, 
on a labyrinth or in a labyrinth when you're walking around and you decide that you need to retrace your steps. You're going to go back the other way and you're going to pass people that are going the wrong way and you're going to tell them not that way. Some of them will walk straight past you because they need to see themselves. Some of them will, they believe you, they, they trust you that you've built enough credit with them. Can you speak a little bit on the, this subject? Yeah, beautiful analogy you found there. And it's, it shows that you reflected upon this, the symbol of the, the, the labyrinth. Working with symbols brings that power exactly. If, if the right person understands symbols, legends, myths, uh, parables, why? They are not one-to-one. -one. They are some maps. They are not a territory. Borges has another story where people of a certain region decide to create a map of the highest accuracy until the map reaches the size that covers the land. It, it has to be the land itself. So the map and the territory becomes equal and it covers their whole land, the size of that map. And what you're pointing is a beautiful way to look at the labyrinth because realizing that I have to retrace. To solve the labyrinth, I have to use various algorithms and one of them is retracing when you hit a wall you retrace your steps until you find an open option that hasn't been explored and then you don't continue to retrace, you take that new option. If you hit the wall, retrace again until you find another open option and of course you will, you will map the whole thing and you will reach the end. When you go back, you have knowledge. You collected an experience, you realize that's a dead end. You're walking back People see you coming back from there. They say, oh, I also want to go there. And you say, don't go there. It's a dead end. I say, but you went there. Yeah. And that's why I'm telling you, go back there. And then there is this conflict. Many students over the years fail to realize, for example, coming to me and working with me, that I'm also in practice or else I wouldn't be much of a teacher. Hence, I don't know the end of the labyrinth. I am just sharing information about what I have explored so far. Sometimes this is an area you want to continue towards. Other times, don't go there. I went, it doesn't work. It's in relation to physical tools. It's in relation to ways of being, emotional states, etc. Don't do that. But you did it all your life. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Don't do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then there is another factor. One of saying, don't do that, but you yourself continue to do that. And they cannot trust that as well, mm -hmm. which is often the case where many people preach something or try to help others. But really the motive behind it is they don't really want to do the work themselves. Doing charity is often coming from that. People want to be charitable. But the essence of it is coming from the place of like, I'm not going to do the real work, so I'm going to help others. It's an escape route. But if you do charity from being a, in a place of a practitioner, of one who, that's a powerful charity. Most charities are not like that. They're not that powerful. With students who have a relationship and it's, it's close, and then you, you have some people, especially with yourself, because of your notoriety, people try to expose your practice. And I've not seen one person that when they've put up their YouTube video or their Facebook advert, and they, they talk about what they've learned from you and, and review it and kind of say that they've got your expertise almost. It doesn't matter how long they've been training for, it isn't the thing because the people that I've noticed if you're going to do that type of thing you don't understand the practice in the first place where which I believe what you were talking about earlier because always ethics teach you to not have ethics and morals there's just correct etiquette it just comes in naturally without having to do it but you can't learn it without explaining these things uh, to go through but from your point of view when I see people do that 
for, for you, I become angry. It makes me very angry. Hmm. Not because I'm an angry person, but because I feel angry for them. How can you be in a room for so many years and not, not have got the point? I don't know if you can talk about that at all. I think it's uh, all required. All these, um, these things, these levels required for them in a certain step of a learning and understanding and require for us because um, it has absolutely no, no effect really over us. And we should uh, not fall into such delusions, but it would sh should notify us about where do we stand in relation to the practice, etc. Every experience is for me beneficial. Every break, every burnt bridge, every bad relationship, every misunderstanding has a potential to fuel the practice and fuel our growth and fuel our transformation. But the moment we grab hold into it, we step out of the practice and we step into the commonality of life. So I, I in my old age and my, uh, and my experience, I've stepped away from this. Um, and I advise it to everyone else. Um, it should notify us how do we behave and we, whether we make a similar mistake. If we make a similar mistake, this might be the reason why sometimes we get agitated or angry by it, which has happened to me before. And then that realization is also very good. But never losing the centrality and the relationship to wanting to transform and to practice. Hence, you're not presenting yourself as some martyr as some saint, you are a work in progress. So what is the great uh, wa amazement or wonder when uh, things are not done perfectly? Of course, I, I make mistakes all the time as well. So they are also entitled to make certain mistakes. And uh, in relation to getting the point, the getting the point is very difficult. And get, getting the point happens to very, very few people. If, if we can say that there is a getting of a point, the getting the point is that there is no point, right, as well. So that should not be expected for most people. Um, in terms of equal, there is equal opportunities. The door is open for everyone and they're invited in. In terms of actually going through the process, it uh, doesn't look far from equal because of the conscious choice and the greed without greed and the acceptance and the, and the self-honesty that has to develop over decades um, towards such an idea, such powerful ideas. Look at how we're working here with myths and stories and from 7 in the morning till 10 in the evening with meditations and and uh, breathing practices for hours and long sessions of three hours of physical work and always under some kind of a watchful eye looking how we do things, how we take them apart, how we put it together. This is no easy thing. I think this is the hardest thing that I ever ran into and not doing it just because it's hard but doing it because it's the only meaningful thing that I have gleaned into. We are here to practice, we are here to learn, we are here to evolve. This life should not be wasted away. On the way, we're going to have fun. On the way, we're going to suffer a lot as well. On the way, we're going to lose all that matters to us, earthly matters, and we're going to also die at a certain point. But we should use the opportunity for what it is, which is a seminar. Well, it just rem reminded me of that. Uh down in the main restaurant years and years ago I came I came to you and I asked permission for something and you said he has just given you a lesson in ethics and I was like what what I knew I knew there was something there was a, there was a gap that I didn't understand so I, I went off and thought I apologized straight away but this would be a good example of the difference between regret and remorse so I will forever be remorseful that there was a gap missing, but we don't know what we don't know. We have a choice to then go and learn it. 
instead of me beating myself up about it that I, I, I dropped the ball once. And in a situation like that where somebody that you respect so much corrects you, that for me is what love is. It's, it's the person realizing that they're going to hurt you. They're going to make you think. They're going to make you feel crap for maybe a couple of days, but they're still willing to give you that in order for you to develop. Regret would be, for me, if I carried this around with me all the time. So it's, it's learn the lesson, put this down, and then be mindful of it in the future. But I don't know if you can talk about that day, whether you remember that, whether you've seen a development in these areas, or the student, student teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Um, this happens a lot, I think, first, you know, we can say it's about love, real love, etc. But most people abuse such a scenario and they would just prick you or do something, but not for the sake of love. But you are right that the real deal is to love, but not the personality, not the current organization, but to realize I love something a lot deeper in that person that matters much more. So at times, it seems like you don't love the ego and the personality and you are yeah. Yeah, stabbing that. And it should be done correctly and it should be done in a manageable way, which will create remorse of conscience, which is fueling the practice. Regret fuels nothing. Regret wastes energy. Yeah. Remorse fuels feels with energy. Once this remorse has been worked through, you are fueled to be better, to transform. In order to transform, we require certain substances, certain energy, certain um, so resources. And regret is just ruminations, and cyclical, you know, beating oneself up. It's an escape. It's, it's a cop-out. There is nothing in it. I regret that. The regret in that case is uh, repetitive without any logic or without any resolution. It just stays within regretting. Remorse is a word that is lost almost. And it's an, it's an emotion that is not often felt. Remorse of conscience means this is not happening again. I got it. I felt the pain, I moved beyond it, and I'll never be the same. It will not happen again. And it's okay if along the way we don't get into that state and we gradually build up into it as long as we reach it in a certain criticalness. Sometimes we need thousands of reps, thousands of loops of life repeating the same thing. Why? You don't, you're, you're being sent something. You're being sent a message by the universe. You, don't, you ignore it. Okay. You receive a bigger message. A log on your head. You ignore it. You receive a piano on your head. You ignore it. And eventually, it reaches a critical mess. The same thing with war. Same thing with, as a culture. We don't get... We don't understand why the wars keep happening again and again and again. Because we don't get the message. Yeah. And what's the message? Somebody with a big beard sitting up in the sky and trying to teach us something? That's not the metaphor I'm thinking. It's a desire of the whole system, whatever the system is, to evolve. So there are pressures all around shaping that system, evolving it. Through pressure, we make diamonds. Yeah. And this, when it's understood, remorse comes to life and regret fall off. Mm. So something that was puzzling me was as a teacher, if you have a lot of experience, you can see in somebody some of the possibilities. So you, you look at the person and you think, if a certain sequence of events happened to this person, you have some type of judgment. It's probably not perfect, but some type of judgment of what could be possible. 
but they can never see it themselves because we, we don't see who we are. So a teacher, we talked about this with Tim, uh, parents, teachers, there's people around us that we need them to mirror us accurately. But the problem is if, if the mirror's dirty, if it's jealous or the mirror is shameful or it's distorted or it's being manipulated by somebody else flexing the back of the mirror, we get a distorted view of ourselves. This, this whole process of the practice, for me, it was about, first of all, cleaning the mirror. And then I turned the mirror around and realized it was a window. And then once I saw other things accurately, I realized I didn't see them accurately. Mm. So it was a set of epiphanies or realizations, which are like rungs on a ladder or steps on a staircase but the staircase gets exponentially bigger. The steps get bigger as you go higher. Mm. Is this something that you've experienced? I, I remember actually realizing that I had an epiphany and not knowing what it was at about the age of three. I kind of like, wow, these things fit together. And then I run and tell my mom and dad and they're like, what are you talking about? Kind of thing, because I don't have the words for it. One thing that I've noticed is my mom suffered a huge, amounts of trauma in her life. She's had a terrible time and she has been absolutely let down by the mental health industry in, in, in England. She's not tried anywhere else, but it's pretty much standard all over the world. And I have not through, it wasn't what my intention was to be able to stumble across the things that help her, but mm -hmm. I helped the things that helped me like people passing on the maze. You try to say, don't go that way. It's taken 71 years of my mum's life and she, she now has the ability to actually listen. And she, in the last year, the transformation is amazing. The, and she said to me, she said to me recently, I had a memory. I stole something as a child from a shop and I was dared to do it. And uh, I took it as a mission. I have to be sneaky. I have to steal this. I have to slide up my sleeve. <laughs> and then when I got home, the person who dared me to do it had told my mum. So now I'm in big trouble. The, the process was put your hand in a chest of drawers uh, with crockery in and it slams. So my hand goes in it. Uh, I was about 11 and she's... She's threatening us. Oh, you see your brother's thumb. You see your brother's thumb. I, I, I'm gonna do this to you if you stick. So, and the fear was was unbelievable. She remembered this recently. Mm. She blocked it out of her head that she had the ability to do that to someone. Mm -hmm. At the time, this is how all of the parents stopped their children doing these things. So mm. it's it's not my mum's fault. But she had this memory, and she said to me, "I, when I remembered it, I did not want to tell you it happened." because I thought you'd forgotten as well. And I, I said, no, 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 I remember this. My brother remembers it all across the board. But the fact that she had the ability to safely come and tell me that she'd done that and, and apologize, it showed the remorse. Yeah. And, and I noticed the relationship that you have with your mum. I'm I'm, in no way am I comparing me and you. We've, we're born in different places, things like this, but this type of the practice, you, it's odd that a child can ever help their parents in this society. So can you speak about how this happened with, with you and your mum at all? Um, my mum is, is one of my primary teachers, you can say, and from a young age. It's not because she was a parent, but because she reached, a, reached this concept of transforming and practicing at a certain age, quite late in life, and I was still young, and this affected me, and those ideas were in my presence. It took us many years to realize that we're in the same work. And then she started to be more involved with in some of my practices, and, and I became more receptive and open to that. Uh, but uh, our relationship was always very close. And then when you are two practitioners, whether it's parent and child or friends or relationship, people are not used to seeing such a relationship. Boyfriend and girlfriend or, or mother and son, 
they're used to all the frictions and all the trauma and all the official relationship quirks of that. But when the two people are practitioners and they're constantly busy looking, working on themselves, diffusing pieces, dissolving pieces in themselves, the relationship is very different. It's very honest. It's very close. There is a lightness to it. Um, the ability to apologize and the ability to, to um, admit wrongdoings is almost immediate. Um, and I, I think this is what many people, when they see my mother come to events and participate and they see our exchanges, our love, our being together, our total honesty and ability to talk about everything, um, it, it, this is what uh, they pick up on. If she was not a practitioner and I was not busy with a practice, um, it wouldn't be the same. Yeah. For me, my mum was a weight which I was dragging along sometimes and carrying and now she's turned into an inspiration because at, there's not many people that have got the character at the age of 71 to change anything. They're, they're stuck, but she has this ability so for me, it's all been worth it. And it's, it, this is what I want for other people as well. I want to help them, regardless of whether it falls on deaf ears or not. If you don't talk about these things openly and honestly, then you're part of the problem that's causing them, is, is this shame in people that makes them not want to talk. This week, we've been doing some work with the voice as well. And for me, this has really helped because my, my voice it was almost ignored for several years. I always knew the answers, but nobody would listen. They, they, like you said earlier, they can't, they can't see. They can't see what's right in front of them. And it, it, it's ridiculous, but obviously with my martial arts career, I, I had to do exponential amounts of achievements before people started listening. But then I've realized, regardless of the achievements, the message would have been the same. And then, it, but I had fun with the achievements. It means a lot to me. But could you speak at all on when, when you had an achievement that you wanted or, or you've noticed other people chasing after an achievement and then when they reach the achievement, it means nothing and it actually sends them into a depression to reach their, their achievement? Yeah, the achievements in general when they're not inside of us, they are already misguided. The only goals should be internal. It, it, it does not mean that we don't require an external package for that internal content. It's very hard to go directly to the point. The direct way is the indirect way. If I, for example, people talking about self-transformation, I'm busy with pe people know me as the movement guy. But it's much better platform often to get a real self-transformation, to put people in great physical effort, to require them to learn physical material, to work with the body, to work with the breath. It brings an honesty that the mind here will not bring the intellect, etc. So I think in that way, the direct transmission is uh, oftentimes doesn't work. I tell you the truth as I see it. But if I make you realize the truth through a myth, through a symbol, the actual process of you solving through that, understanding that, brings you the actual understanding. Saying something brings you maybe a knowing, but not this level of understanding. It means a myth includes the practice inside of it, and a story does not. It's not the same. A symbol includes the actual practice inside of it because it symbolizes something. You have to find that an allegory, a parable. Movements carry movement. 
we need movement because that's how movement is carried. Like we need to carry liquids, we have bottles. But we forget about the actual important thing. Us and this evolution of the real us inside of that. And then external goals, which are needed for this transformation, become the center point and it doesn't work. You become empty every time you hit them. And there are two occasions. Most people are not even good about achieving these external goals. So what happens? They stay with the delusion because they've never achieved it. They've never became a world champion like you or made the money that, you know, they want to make, etc. So they're still in the delusion of the rat race. Those who have achieved it split again into two groups. Those who realized it and those that keep on running after it as if it worked the first time, which it didn't. Few people get the message. Turn in. This way around. This, for me, this message is, is massive because I, I'm lucky enough to have friends that have nothing apart from themselves, and that's the best friends. <laughs> and I have friends who have, have done all sorts of stuff all over the world, but it's, it's the ones that are doing it for the right reason and the way they do it. And I often see people come into martial arts because they've been bullied. Their parents think, well, they've been bullied. I'm going to take them to a martial arts class to toughen them up. But they, the parents don't realize that the child can't even speak up to its own parents. So how is it ever going to be able to speak up to a bully? It doesn't feel safe. And then, mm. then you can go into polyvagal theory and the different aspects of why the voice closes down when we're in fear and why we freeze. And p people in the martial arts just don't understand this. Mm. And I often say, I can't even remember where I got these ones, but if you want to make somebody not back off in a fight, stand behind them with a tiny pin and every literally it can't even hurt them but it will shock them when they step backwards you do that three times and even the weakest individual becomes a tyrant in the ring and they'll plow forwards because they mm. don't want to get spiked in the back and it, it, it's, it's this different ways of doing it which could be classed as abuse in some form if they if they don't know what's going to happen they don't make an agreement even if they do agree if they're agreeing out of fear it com becomes abusive how would you express what safety really is? Is it the robustness that we build through the practice? Is, is it, are you lucky if you come into the world with two good parents who treat you safely? Because even in those households that I've seen, they may feel physically safe, but they may be neglected emotionally. They may, they may not have a financial education. And then you get people that, they get given lots of money and it ruins them because of it. They don't have the skills to manage it. So this, this theme of safety in the world, is it something that's just a new phrase on the internet or is it, is it really there? Safety is an illusion. There is no possibility to achieve safety in a system that yearns for change and transformation and everything increases in complexity and everything wants to evolve and survive. So safety is not the way of nature. <laughs> there is certain resiliency in relation to certain aspects, but total safety as a concept is impossible. A lot of people who received the good back in their childhood from their parents seemed safer, but it's also an illusion that can be exposed in if the circumstances change. It doesn't mean that it doesn't serve them. Even though it was an illusion, they believed in that illusion and that creates safety, a certain safety. Yeah. But, uh, and, and we should try to provide that, but ultimately that will not hold, hold water as well. For example, your parents tell you, you're the prettiest, you're the best, you're the smartest. And then you go to school and you realize you're not the smartest, you're not the prettiest, you're not the best, you're not the strongest. And this might break your belief system in the whole upbringing if it was ridiculous, if it was out of proportion. Now you would lose your safety and you would lose your belief in what has been told to you. Um, so how can we provide safety? Ultimately, slowly, slowly, 
we need to reach a place which is often characterized by no more fear of death in some spiritual paths that comes from the realization that because of the transformative nature of things, nothing goes to waste. Nothing can truly die. Not in the way that we often think about it. At the same time that everything dies, everything is also born. This brings a level of comfort, of peace, that we all want to develop. It's not going to happen in childhood. So what are you going to provide the child? Temporary means. Temporary labyrinths to work him towards that deeper awareness. One of the important things, for example, a show of disgust is very important and not often acknowledged is that an important part of an education of a child is not, not to allow and not to promote shows and this demonstrations of disgust, to be disgusted by things. This brings, for example, safety. Because you see clearly. But many parents do the opposite. They are themselves iffy about things. Mm. And because of this, you start to create a very sensitive system that is disgusted by everything, etc. For example, if you need to change the diapers of your mother, your loved one, it is, can you do it? And most people cannot. It represents their capacity to love. It represents many things, but it's related to this too often and too powerful expressions of disgust in young age. It's good to pick up a bug, to teach children not to be disgusted, to, to know their body, to know what is the... Not to create disconnects, not to create taboos about nudity, about, uh, about uh, liquids, about uh, food, about a lot of things. And I think this is not often mentioned, so yeah. I'm, I'm offering that as well here. And... In the events, I'm trying to bring a layer of that as well. So I'm using certain language that might be disgusting sometimes. And I present it in a gradual way. And I present it in a way that makes people realize. And I talk about myself. I talk about my experiences in life, whether they were harsh or, or repulsive. And I'm, I'm asking, for example, from people. And this honesty starts to unlock people calm down, relax, and now a space of transformation comes to the surface. So from, from this you said we need to ponder and accept our termination. We, we, we're not going to be here forever. And I think what's happened with a lot of people now, we're so fragile that not only can we not look at our own physical mental and emotional termination or financial bankruptcies, things like this, we, we end up in a position where we treat making a mistake as the, the worst thing. We're so scared of making and putting our foot wrong because of the judgment of others. So, so just a simple mistake is frightening enough to cause what, what, what Freud would call an ego death. And people are so upset of that that they f they only feel safe when no mistakes are made which causes freezing they, they don't want to go out they don't want to try anything so they eat at the same restaurant they wear the same clothes every day they won't try anything new even even down to changing the cereal that they eat for the breakfast mm -hmm. is, is this along those yeah, lines definitely definitely you understand and that is not a Practice. Uh, practice is all about the mistakes. It's all about the questions. I need essentially to do a lot of mistakes. How can I do all these mistakes as efficiently as possible and draw as many conclusions as I can from them? That's what dictates the level of my practice, the level of my learning. When you see somebody impressive, directly correlated to the amount of mistakes that have been made, not the lack of them. Yeah, that's powerful. In terms of corrections with a, a student, for example, so I believe that a student could do anything to me. 
So, so they could do absolutely like, uh, they'd have to do something extremely shocking by this point for me to say, I never want to see you again because I've had some things happen and I always want them back because I know that if they go away, it's going to lead them back to me anyway, that all the practice, not to me, but to what we're trying to teach. And if they stay, then they're going in the direction of the same circle anyway. But what I, what I do say is that, so remorse would have to be shown, an apology, learn to apologize properly because you will not progress on the practice. And, and a few people get to this point in the practice where something has happened, whether it be they drop the ball physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, ethically, everything like this, and then they can't pick the ball back up. The, the shame is so great that they have to disappear. They don't want to see you again. Mm. And they, there's stories created that from my side, from their side, it, the whole yeah. thing changes very rapidly. But is, is this the right thing to do to accept people back for mistakes? Because I, I believe with, with me, with my classes, my school, if they've got the balls to walk in the door, then they belong there. Mm -hmm. There has to be limits to, to things, boundaries, and there is always a possibility of fixing things at the same time. This is a paradox. They need to know, and we need to know, their limits, they are protecting us. The opposite of love is boundaries. People think of boundaries sometimes as love, but it's not. There are two opposing forces. And then love is the ability to accept back, and both of these forces have to be at work. Um, we often confuse, by the way, a lot of concepts. Like, for example, worry and care, worrying especially, is regarded by most people as a form of love. It's actually the end of love. When a mother worries, a mother stops loving. And it's something I heard from a, an Israeli doctor uh, by the name of Nader Buto. It's a, an, I, an idea that I appreciate. Uh, so it's always good to be able to pick things up. Nothing is fatal, nothing is the end. There is always a room for apology, for recognition. But there has to be also that part. There has to be a learning for that to occur. And that's what I believe in for myself and for others. I want to fix something. I go, I apologize. What will be the next thing is now on the other side. But I have to make first an apology, an honest apology, if I believe I was wrong. And then whether that will open the possibility to return back into some kind of a relationship or a system that takes more factors to, to calculate in. The last question is, we have this saying that happens quite a lot, is the, the practitioners knew that already. It happens a lot. And there's a new studies being put together which are amazing. They're talking about, so, so Christopher, Dr. Christopher Palmer is talking about how mitochondria affects mental health because where the thoughts come from, they're produced within a system, within a body, through experiences, through the way that we interact with the world. We accumulate interactions. They have friction, so we think about them. Why does it happen that so many times the science is catching up with the practice and then they find out that maybe the science wasn't quite right and it changes. So the idea of this for the, for the people watching is that we have a metabolic issue within the body. Obviously, different types of training affect the physical body. We know that exercise is, is good for people. However, things like walking, running, cycling, rowing, rhythmic movements are naturally soothing anyway. So they're going to, how do you put a baby to sleep? How, like, uh, sexual intercourse should have rhythms, th these type of things. So they, they're going to make us feel good anyway. Mm. But feeling good does not mean better. It doesn't mean cure. It just means temporary 
emotional grat gratification, quick instant gratification. Mm. But can you speak on a little bit about how these topics that are now on on podcasts all over the world, the the books that are being written, that the ideas have been there for a long time, but the practitioners knew this already. The practice is the the for me it's the core of things. The universe practices. This evolution is an expression of the practice of the universe, the practice of of Mother Nature, the practice of God, the practice and the hands, as above, so below, also the practice of man. And because practice operates by this very basic functionality that expresses itself in the laws of adaptation, in physical laws, you can see it across many different fields, in neurology, in chemistry, it will always contain a deeper truth that is harder for us to encapsulate, to grab a hold of. So we need the podcast, we need the oversimplifications, we need the proof, we need the specific example. Once we find a specific example, we tend to make it into a rule or a law, and it never works, and there are exceptions. But once you look at things through this wider point of view, you might not be as pinpointed and as accurate as it seems by science, what science is presenting, but you're in line with the nature of things. So it's a philosophical construction as well that creates inside of you the practitioner. It creates inside of you a structural framework of ideas, of concepts that are orienting your behavior, your evolution, your growth. This will always be primary and then the details will change. Today it's this and tomorrow it's that. We need to be told to get sun exposure in the morning for 10 minutes to feel good. But if you practice, you're naturally moving outdoors, you're naturally in physical activity, the sun is hitting your skin, etc. We need now to be told to come out of the buildings and we keep discovering more and more specific details. This is good. It's good that we substantiate. But it's not good that we wait for that, which is so late, often misguided, often falls off and changes, temporary, to guide our life's doing. I don't have time. I want to use my time here, and hence I'm using something that circumvents this. And I use science to pinpoint issues and to resolve problems and to support it. In essence, I am cheer cherry picking. It's true. It shouldn't be demonized. Everybody's cherry picking. You can't avoid it. The cherry picking doesn't mean that I am losing my religion, losing my objectivity, but it means that I have a principles that stand behind and I am observing what is manifesting in terms of the small details and continue to orient myself and reshape my, um, my belief system, my point of view, my creed, my creed of the practitioner. Um, and that is required, that requires a lot of effort, a lot of thinking, reflection, practice, another form of practice to take care of the practice. And it, it continues like this. I think this is crucial, this is important, because this piece is missing, we replace it with podcasts, watered-down advice, quick slogans, quotes, rumors of a practice, but not really a practice. The glue underneath is missing. That's missing. So yesterday, just to finish, you said that we get the leaders we deserve, which is why we've got a lot of shitty leaders out there. For me, I feel like I found maybe a leader in yourself, which I deserve, but that's only because you've helped me become a form of the student I hope you deserve. 
So I'd like to thank you for your time and your effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. At the end of these conversations, I'd like to take a little bit of time to sit and reflect on some of the messages. This one's going to take me a lot longer. Thank you to Edo for spending the time and effort on what was a very busy week that he had organised in an intensive training camp. It was an amazing camp. I got to meet some great people, new people, old friends. The thing that I've taken the most from this is everybody's trying to solve the puzzle of their life. The paths cross like the garden of forking paths. We intersect with other people on occasions. And if we can share ideas and concepts, it might help them when they get to a dead end in the labyrinth. It looks like we're all going in different directions because we're passing in this labyrinth back and forth. Some people go the wrong way. They retrace their steps. Some people manage to take a, a lucky path. Some people do the hard work. Some people put lots of effort in in the wrong place. So they're working hard, but they're not getting anywhere. Ends in exhaustion. But really, we're all actually heading in the same direction. Because when you're in a labyrinth, as long as you keep going, you'll end up in the middle. Once you're in the middle, you find your centre. And then you work out what to do from there. Where do you orientate yourself after this? Normally, you realise you've just transcended one labyrinth and you've ended up in a bigger one and it ends up with moving parts. So we go from small puzzles to huge complex problems and the way we solve them. I'm hoping this helps my students. I'm hoping it helps people that I've never met. But if it falls on deaf ears, so be it. But as long as one person maybe gets a glimpse, an epiphany, a realisation from this process and this conversation, then it's well worth it. Thanks, Edo, and thanks for listening to everybody else as well. Take it easy.